kind enough to call him easily his busiest stretch. World Series last night, World Series tonight, Thursday night football tomorrow, World Series over the weekend. Uh, here on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line on the Rich Eisen Show from Houston, Texas, is the great Joe Buck. How are you, Joe? I'm good. Are we supposed to believe that Rudd flies commercial? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, on, this was Joe. five and a half years ago, Joe. This is pre-Marvel Universe. So oh, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe. I think I've known those... Paul a long time. I've never known him to mix with the, you know, the common folk. <laughs> when did you meet? You met him. Did you, did you, did you like make mixtapes together back in the day or something like that? Is that true? Is that Well, what? we have, we have a mutual friend. His name's Preston Clark. He lives okay. in St. Louis. And okay. Preston was my best friend in high school. Preston's mm-hmm. little sister, Sarah, mm-hmm. who was in the show 24, Dated throughout high school, John Hamm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when Preston went to KU, um, he was roommates with Rudd. And I became friends with Rudd because he was friends with my best friend. And then Rudd dated Sarah for just a little bit. So it's kind of this weird little group <laughs> of people that all know each other from the Clark's living room in Ladue, Missouri, back in the <laughs> 80s. And uh, we've been friends ever since. Rudd. Tell you this about Rudd. I always I, I joke about him, but no matter the success, I mean, even back when he was in Clueless, and we were all just freaking out. I used to watch him do bar mitzvahs, and <laughs> DJ, and and I was going around in L.A. with him. The guy has never changed. He's the same person he was back then, which is the best thing you can say about somebody after success. And facially too, like <laughs> the same thing. He does not. He looks the same. Yeah, I don't like, know uh, what's going on there. I mean, right. he, in some ways, he looks, he was a little bit more, uh, you know, beat up back in the 80s. I, I think he's, uh, I don't know what he's doing, but I want to figure it out because I want to do it myself. This whole, this whole, this whole conversation feels like we're one degree removed from Kevin Bacon. I got to be honest with you, Joe. I'm sure they, I'm sure they've done something in the past. So uh, let's just call it a, let's just call it a match. And we've, we've gotten to Kevin Bacon somehow. Fantastic. How are you doing? You're good. I mean, this is, do you, this is this is like dream come true stuff that you're in the middle of right now. I know you've done it before and you'll do it again and all that stuff, but this is pretty cool, man. I'll yeah, be but I probably here. won't because Thursday night football goes away ah, that's true. Uh, after this year. Okay, so, that's right. Okay, then you go. And and Thursday in these postseason series kind of has become the travel day. So you know when everybody else you know Smoltz is playing. 88 holes of golf on a Thursday. I'm doing Thursday night football, which I love, and I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But, yeah, this is probably the last year that uh, I'll have to be bouncing all over the place. That'll be only if Smoltz can get on a course in Atlanta. Do you think he knows somebody that can get him on? Yeah, you know? he's got uh, – he used to pitch there. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he's he got some connections to golf courses and uh, oh, man. and free dinners and uh, mayoral candidates and everything else. You know, it's kind of crazy, I, Joe. Uh, I mentioned at the top of the show here that um, I was a 26-year-old – at Sports Center in 1996, a big diehard Yankee fan, sitting there and watching the Braves take a 2-0 lead on the Yankees in that World Series. And then last night was their first World Series win since then. And you were calling the World Series for Fox for the very first time. And it's just amazing how, you know, time flies and yet it goes so long and these Braves now have a 1-0 lead, and it was it, it ended a long drought for them. And you called both games. It's kind of wild. Yeah, so, you know? no, I know. And uh, this is number 24 for me, which is hard to believe. I never thought I would do one. And, you know, that I remember that World Series coming down back to the – at old Yankee Stadium, the truck compound was in the same area where everybody parked, and a lot of the players and Steinbrenner parked in there. There were times where George Steinbrenner used to – monitor who was in that parking lot <laughs> and parking next to Yankee Stadium and it was just surreal to see <laughs> like George the, Steinbrenner in the parking lot like going who are you why are you parking come on anyway, are you serious he I, was, I, I, he was... as sure as I'm standing here that happened <laughs> um but yeah and and I remember that series coming down after game two and it was my first time kind of on the big stage and got through the first two games and we had no travel day because there was a rain out uh, uh, mm. before game one. And uh, so we were kind of busting it to Atlanta and I'm walking into the truck compound and every executive and, and our guy who was in charge of PR is walking out like, Oh my God, we're dead. 
we're dead. It's 2 nothing. It's going back to Atlanta. It's going to be a four-game sweep. And uh, we all know how that World Series turned out. So, uh, you know, these things change in a heartbeat. And I, if you had asked me after game three who was going to win the ALCS, right. I would have told you Boston and, and, you know, bet a lot on it. And then the thing just completely flipped. So that's the fun of this. And who knows where this thing is. Exactly. Is. Although it does. I mean, the Braves are on a remarkable roll, Joe. I mean, winning 20 of 25, a run differential of 51 in that time. And then the guys who are coming through are all the trade deadline guys that – nobody outside of Atlanta paid attention to because we were look at the bright, shiny objects that the Dodgers and Yankees pulled off two at a time, you know, and these guys are just unbelievable right now with the Braves, you know? Yeah, no. And, and I think that's a good point. Something I really hadn't thought about. Um, you know, you, you tend to, to gravitate nationally to the big, easy names. And I, I think what happened with Atlanta in July, right after they lost, um, Acuna before the all-star game is they made the deal and they got Jack Peterson. So now the Cubs fire sale is on and the Atlanta Braves clubhouse. Those guys have said it sent a message that they're not quitting on us. And that was a team that was under 500. uh, And I think four games out, but definitely under 500 at the all-star break. And then they added three more guys in their outfield and they got Duvall who ended up hitting 38 home runs and leading the national league in RBIs. They got Eddie Rosario that there was no big deal and he was hurt when they picked him up, but they were willing to wait. And uh, I don't know who's the other guy that they got, but whatever, they got four outfielders and go oh, Soler who, Soler who leads off last night. Yep with a home run and becomes the first guy ever to be the first batter of a world series and go deep. And, and he had a, a kind of a bounce back here. So it, I, I think it sends the message to a team that's, you know, getting beat up every day that we're, we still believe in you. And I, I think there's some truth in that. And they, they kind of took off once August hit. Joe Buck here on the Rich Eisen show. And then let's turn the page after tonight's game. You go to Arizona with Green Bay, I mean, how how do you juggle all this? Like, do you do you zoom with the coaches or call them or whatever now or get yeah, notes? Yeah, we or pretty you... much do that anyway. Right. Um, so that that's going to be difficult uh, because our conference call with Green Bay is tonight at six, and pitch number one is at seven. Come on. So uh, I'm going to have to steal somebody's notes like I'm back in college. But I, I've already <laughs> done the Packers this year. We had them week one, and, right. and I've done them. 14,000 times. So there's just little updates that we get from these guys. And Aaron's so good with us uh, just being honest and, and giving us pretty much, you know, exactly who's playing well, what they're trying to do against Arizona. Arizona's defense, I was working on it last night till, God, I don't know, 230. And you start looking at that defense, and it's really good. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, all the eyes go to Kyler Murray, and for good reason. But that defense, They've been playing, excuse me, a couple games without Chandler Jones. So now they get him back, uh, and Green Bay is is light without a couple of receivers going into this game as we sit here and talk now. So I, I think it. I think Green Bay's got their hands full going out there against an undefeated team. It's still Green Bay. It's still Aaron Rodgers, and and they can beat anybody. But I. They're, they're, they're going to have their hands full tomorrow night. No doubt. And it's unfortunate about Adams and Lazard both being out with Adams having it and Lazard being an unvaccinated close contact. And he's out now. And that is unfortunate. And it's a totally different team, as you know, than the one that you saw in week one. What the hell, right? I mean, like you were there. What What's your two, two cents on what happened on that day for Green Bay that has now been completely wiped out with a nice six-game win streak and they're doing what we expect from them? What about yeah, that? I don't know if that was remnants from kind of the weird off season. And, and I think, I mean, people that were close right. to Aaron Rodgers to the green Bay Packers said it's over. He's not coming back. And, and I don't think they had any clue that that thing would work out. And, and I'm here to tell you, thank God it did. I mean, it just, it just felt, it feels right. Him coming back to the green Bay Packers. It certainly changes our entire outlook at Fox with our schedule, especially down the stretch. Um, and they're, they've won six in a row. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they looked terrible and, you know, by the, by the same token, I knew new Orleans has been winning games, but they look like they, they didn't miss a beat mm-hmm. and their offense looks a little 
stagnant and different than we're used to seeing. So I think it's just week one. You know, it's Belichick always said if, if the first four games of the season, he's treated like the preseason. And um, I, I think they're still trying to figure out what they have. The first few games, at least uh, coming off what is a lighter training camp than, than a lot of these coaches are used to having from decades gone by so which team joe buck that you've seen with your own two eyes do you think is is the most impressive best yet so far Mm -hmm. through seven weeks well i mean i don't know how you can't you i i haven't seen with my own two eyes until tomorrow night arizona so um i'm anxious to see that but i i think i think the rams and what they can do offensively and with mcveigh and stafford as long as he stays healthy Cup, I mean, just having a world-beating kind of a year, leading the league in catches and receiving yards and touchdowns. I mean, I, I don't know that he gets the attention that he deserves because he just kind of goes about his business. Um, but I, I think those are the top two teams in their division and in the NFC. Um, and Dallas looks really good. You know, they look different. They're winning games that they – didn't typically win or haven't been winning over, I mean, many, many years. Like the the game they beat the Chargers where it was, you know, on the road, they just lost to Tampa Bay. And then they, they end up getting down the field and they end up with a long field goal that they make and win and get out of town. And they're beating teams they should beat. Uh, I'm anxious to see how the cap is for Dak Prescott and if that's going to hamper him at all uh, going forward. But I, I think those are the three best teams that I've seen in person. And Cincinnati looks for real and good for them because uh, Burrow's awesome and Chase is as good as we've seen coming into the league in a long time. You had the Bucks and the Rams, right, too? Did you guys do that one? Yeah, I'm not even, I, I, you know, that I, shame on me because I didn't even bring up Tampa Bay. No, but, I mean, you you, you watched them in their, their one loss this year. But, I, I mean, Brady, man, that uh, that's just the only two words. That's all I've got to say. It's just, <laughs> it's just the only. It's, it's no it's question. Just, just Brady, man. Uh, there's no. It's other... just unbelievable, and they they and he make it look so easy. And I think Todd Bowles, you know, I I, I know that it didn't work out well in New York with the Jets, but I, I just think he's a head coach candidate that needs another chance. He he is so mm. good, and if there's a single person other than Brady that won that Super Bowl over Kansas City it was Todd Bowles in my mind and and now he's doing it maybe they don't jump to my mind because of all the injuries defensively in their secondary but uh yeah they, it's it's special to watch this and and it's fun for us having you know had Brady in the AFC for so long we only did a handful of his games and now to see him on on a more regular basis he could not be cooler on the phone and more open and relaxed and I just think he's having fun at a level he's never had in the NFL in his incredible career. And, and fun and that talent and that drive is, is a pretty scary combination for everybody else. What's it like having uh, a front row seat to a conversation between Brady and Aikman? Where, you know, Aikman, Aikman's got three, which is a remarkable number, and Brady's now doubled that up plus one. And the, the amount of experience, championship experience, Hall of Fame experience, I'd love to be – just get a, a glimpse of what that's yeah, like. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's fun. To answer your question, it's it's enjoyable for me because both guys are really honest. Um, Tom told us all, you know, we kind of rode that roller coaster with him because we had them week one last year to see where they went from week one mm-hmm. to winning the Super Bowl. You know, we had them in week one, then we had them in the NFC Championship game, and the ease and the comfort in that system and how he and Arians came together was just a thing of beauty, and now there's so so far ahead of where they were last year. Brady told us before the Rams game that there were times last year where plays would come in and he didn't know what he was supposed to do. And uh, it's, it's just, that's because he was a new player in a new system with, you know, that weird off season and virtual meetings. And now, uh, and, and he really praises left, which too, he, he thinks Byron left, which is, fantastic and and he says the two of them are seeing the game <clears throat> the same way now and and that should be scary for the opposition I, I i just marvel at him and it's hard to do a game and not just go on and on and on about how great he is but if there's anybody that deserves that kind of praise on national tv uh it's tom brady well i mean we don't see anything like it I just uh, i guess bring it all full circle here with the two endeavors that you're you're undertaking this week 
I mean, what's the comparison? Uh, I know they're totally different sports. I mean, you see pool holes, right? Um, still raking uh, left-handed pitchers, but he's he's he would be in a like next year, Albert, if he wants to keep playing and do it. Well, like what an American League platoon role at first or DH or something like. I mean, Brady is at, at 44 years in a contact sport. It's just he, he's as good that's as he's ever thing. been. It's there's no I don't know if we could even compare it. At that's all. the thing. I mean, that's like you know last year with the total touchdowns that he had by the end of the year, including the postseason. It's basically you know he shot his age, and <laughs> and you do that in golf and everybody freaks out, but in golf people aren't trying to take your head off so uh you know it's it's just unbelievable and i believe him when he says he believes he could play till he's 50 or or longer than that and it's just the family dynamic that would probably put an end to it i mean he takes care of himself he's driven i think the comparison and you know you being a yankee fan i i just as far as sustained excellence the look in the eye, the guy that wants the ball in his hands with the game on the line, it's Jeter. I just haven't seen anybody in my time in baseball doing 24 World Series now. And and I don't know analytically what the numbers would have said, mm. and, and that's where analytics breaks down a little bit for me. Uh, if, if somebody says, okay, well, at the end of his career, you know, analytically – statistically he wasn't a great shortstop well if the bases are loaded two out yeah. and they're leading by a run who do you think you want the ball hit to right the guy who wants it and and that's that was jeter and and that's tom brady but Bra- brady's in a class by himself period well said joe as always although i gotta tell you i showed my kids happy gilmore for the first time they would <laughs> they would have a problem with saying no one wants to take your head off in golf they would they would see that yeah you know? well barker yeah. Barker comes up. You know, I can tell you, throwing it laps. Was... I didn't know Barker was left-handed. Maybe it was like that, but... <laughs> Joe. I got to tell you, it was kind of a uh, a wild moment, sad moment, all at the same time, but enjoyable moment. Susie and I had to pause that scene and explain to the children who Bob Barker was and why this was particularly funny. It was. So really... Did you take the next step and say that you know back when we were kids? Yes. You know. Bob Barker was was just a staple on our TV. And one day he said, you know what? I'm showing up Greg. And it was just crazy. It was mind-blowing to me. Like, was what? A, yeah. Boy, that was a rough weekend. It was. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but he was, uh, you know, one of the best. He's on the Mount Rushmore. Everybody wants to do Mount Rushmore. He's on the Mount Rushmore of uh, game show. Oh, my gosh. All right, Joe. Uh, I'm now, now there's you two. I, I never asked you. How was Jeopardy? How was that for you? Was that a total it was bl- fun? Yeah. I loved it. It was. It was. Uh, How was that? It was a blast. I I, I I tried to inject a little humor and okay. tried to make it feel like a little bit of a sporting event because mm-hmm. it is a competition. Okay. And uh, did my week and got out of there and glad I did. Uh, you're the best, Joe. Uh, safe travels. Best to Michelle. You take care of yourself. Okay. Best be to well. Susie Thanks, bud. and all your friends in the studio. Yeah, we're all here. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hey, Joe. Hi, Joe. Yeah, Joe. You, guys, you guys asleep wait, for Wait, no, Joe, time. seriously, yeah. how relaxed are you during the game? Because they keep cutting to you guys, and you're just, like, leaning back in the chair, like, My shirt daughter rolled sent up. me a screenshot of that today. She's like, Dad, you look like you're at, at your desk at home. And <laughs> the problem is it's a faulty chair. If I lean back, I either would have to tilt forward it's a bad old chair, and mm-hmm. if I if I lean back one ounce of my body weight, the chair just flops back. So I I just uh, instead of instead of putting my terrible hairline in front of your face, mm. I'd rather just lay back and and be relaxed. I mean, does Fox? I yeah, mean, what's, what's going on? Uncle I Joe. mean, what, what's what's happening there? I mean, is Simpson not making as much money anymore? The Simpsons? Do like, you think Fox or any network would bring in their own chairs for us? No. We we oh, use so. what Todd. I'm sitting in Todd Callis's chair that he sits there all year doing the Astros. <laughs> baseball throwing the Astros under the bus. <laughs> oh That's man, a bad chair. A bad chair is a bad so chair. So you're expecting better chairs in Atlanta? What's I mean? What's going on? I mean, it's a newer park. The, the chairs have to be better. understood. Yeah, well, Smoltz again. Smoltz is going to have a throne. I mean, like, look. I mean, you're you're entering the lair pretty much. He's gonna, he's gonna, honestly, he's yeah. going to have like the Iron well. Throne there, like like Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's what it's going to look like for you. You'll be fine. I, I, be, yeah. It is the Game of Thrones chair. 
it's will be sitting there for John. I'll still have like a little fold chair. <laughs> you're gonna uh, that yeah. you can find it at a, at a bad banquet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get Pete Van Weeren's old stool. That's what you'll get. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. How about that for a pull? Yeah. How about that for a pull at the very end? That was I don't know where I got so that good. one. Okay. How good were those, those TBS broadcasts, oh. Oh. like Glenn Hubbard and oh, Biff Pokoroba and all those guys? <laughs> you know, I, I, was, right I was told years ago, because I did the Skip Carey impersonation on, on SportsCenter way back in the day, I guess now going total full circle here. Uh, Skip Carey pulled the usual uh, drill that by old school announcers with young bucks that they didn't really uh, appreciate um, by acting like he didn't know who I was. And everybody on TBS told me he exactly heard all that I did when I saw him at the World Series that we're talking about, this 96 World Series. Uh, he came up. Wait, to, let me hear it. I went up to him and I said, Skip, I just want to let you know I am a big fan. I know I'm doing a lot of your my imitations of you and it's done out of appreciation for you. I just went up to him. And he, you know what his response was? He looked at my press pass to check my name. He goes, oh, thanks. And then walked away. That's what he said. Baller move. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Like, oh, what's your name again? Well, who are you? Who are right. you? Who's, who well, are you? Michael's told the story. Al Michael's told the story when he was on Monday Night Baseball. From his lair in L.A., they piped him in. And Michael's told the story of when Bob Costas first met uh, Howard Cosell. Oh yeah, that's right. In Baltimore, and he says, uh, "I'm sure you've heard the story a hundred times from Al." But he Please. says, uh, "Bob comes up to this is Al, and he said, hey, 'Hey, I'm Bob Costas. I just started at NBC.' And oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Nice to meet you. I know who you are." And then he goes up to Cosell. Hi, I'm Bob Costas. And Cosell stops him and says, "I know who you are." <laughs> You're the child who rhapsodizes about the infield fly rule <laughs> and then walked on. And then that, that was, he just said that as he was passing Bob. Like, no, I'm good. That's the baller move. Right. I've met enough people today. <laughs> Take care of yourself, Joe. Safe travels. We'll chat soon. You're the best. Okay. There you go. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Buck. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.